in and tell them that we went to the drive-in. Here's a movie that I think everyone has on their list that they've seen at least three or four times. The Mole People is a 1956 science fiction meets adventure exploring movie, which was brought to us by Universal Pictures and directed by Virgil W. Vogel. Double V's, wow. We open with a science lecture from this guy named Dr. Frank C. Baxter, which is his name in real life too, actually. He's going to eventually lead us into our title screen, but until then, he's gonna tell us about how there's so much space under the Earth's crust that we have yet to explore. And then we're gonna one day get to the center of the Earth. But hey, that's a different movie. Hold your horses, man. After this monologue and the opening from the monster with the ocean floor, do we really know anything about this Earth? Pretty cool title screen here. And the music is intense, too. Jump down to somewhere in Asia where Dr. Stewart, played by Phil Chambers, and Dr. Bentley, played by returning mega movie drive-in alumni, a man who needs no introduction, Mr. John Ager. He and the other doctor are digging up Oh, hey, look, it's Nestor Piava. He's back again, too. He plays Professor Lafarge. They are digging up, well, we don't really know, but they discover this tablet, and it's in a spot that it shouldn't be. Next, they need to translate. It seems like there's a god king talked about on this tablet that no one has ever heard of. Sorry, I forgot to mention the other guy's name here. That's Dr. Jude Bellman, played by Hugh Belmont. Then a man and his son drop off a crazy looking artifact they found somewhere up on the mountain. Turns out it's an oil lamp with the same markings as the tablet. This thing says that the mountain is the way into a civilization that might lead even deeper into the earth. This is the way. So what's the plan? We're going up to the top of the mountain to see what we can find up there. All this risk and money because of a vague poetic inscription on an ancient oil lamp. The fellow on the left is Nazar, played by Rod Redwing. He's going to be the guy leading up the top of this mountain. We get some nice stock footage spliced in here of real mountain climbers. There's a few random avalanches here and there, and... Avalanche! One brings down another mannequin-looking statue of some sort. I guess it's supposed to be marble, but whatever. We know our heroes are getting close to something now. So they reach this plateau, which I guess is where they've actually been trying to go the whole time. And when they get there, they come across these ruins of a temple. Unfortunately for Dr. Stewart, he steps on the wrong spot, and... Oh yeah, he's gone, no question. So they descend into the hole to try to find him. And they find him dead at the bottom. Did I mention he was dead yet? One of the restraints comes loose, and Nazar tries to fix it, but it causes a cave-in... and on top of him. The three remaining take this cave they discover all the way to the end, which brings them to some sort of underground civilization. They address where the light comes from right off the bat. What do you make of the light? Probably some chemical in the rocks. Oddly, they decide to take a break and a nap, but that gets interrupted. Next thing they know, they're waking up in a cave or a dungeon of some sort. Inside, they find skeletons of, well, we don't really know. Well, they don't really know, but we know what they are. We also see our first underground people, and they escort them to some sort of what looks like a ceremony. This is the high priest of Ishtar, Elnu, played by Alan Naper. Creepy fucking looking dude. And he flat out tells the king that these three are imposters, and they're just bad news. King Sheru is played by Arthur Gilmore, and he says, Sorry guys, you're not from around here, so you have to die. Wow. The king says, You must burn in the fires of Ishtar. But not today, says Bentley. He kills a guard, though. Good for him. 
Bentley whips out his flashlight, and it turns out that these people can't handle any kind of bright light. That flashlight is going to become the center of attention very shortly. God, do not run! Look at him. No pigmentation. Without sun or ultraviolet rays, they turn into albino. Pupils are enlarged to let in the maximum amount of low-intensity light. Optical nerve must be hypersensitive. That's why they couldn't stand the light. They explore more of the caves as a way to escape, and they discover the mole people pits, as I guess I'm gonna call it. And these guys are dicks to them, too. They send the mole people after the three of them, and Laflarge... Well, you shouldn't have fucked around, man. They cover him with rocks, and yeah, no one's gonna find him there later. The priest calls off the mole people and decides to let Bentley and Bellman come to stay at the king's place as his guests. Because they hold the power of the gods. Told you that flashlight's gonna come back. At the king's banquet, they bullshit with the king about how they're actually just sent down here to check on what's going on by Ishtar herself. This one blonde servant drops the food tray. Bad news for her. But Bentley cuts off that punishment real quick, though. Back at the king's suite, Ada, or Ada, that's the girl he saved, played by Cynthia Patrick, offers herself to Bentley, but he's like, hey, hey listen, you're free now, do whatever you want. While he explains to her what's beyond the caves, the priest overhears them talking. He's getting kind of suspicious, if you couldn't tell. He's pretty much going to hatch a plan to try to get that uh, flashlight off of Bentley. While the two remaining doctors explore the caves, actually they're really trying to find a way out, the mole people are starting to lash out against the guards. They decide to strike this one guy because he's hungry. But again, Bentley steps in and says, leave him alone. Do you realize you're bringing disaster on our heads? And yours too? Oh yeah, by the way, this guy, who was the lead guard, or known as the first officer from the credits, is played by Robin Hughes, but he's gone. Did you learn that song as a child? So Ada spills the beans that their king really doesn't think that Bentley and the others are gods. Bentley doesn't seem that interested right now, but then he gets cock-blocked by the king. He says they found one of their main guards dead, and he wants to help teach the beast a lesson. By the way, they keep calling the mole people the beasts of the dark. They say, no thanks, we're not going to help you with this. So the king says, fine, just pick any three and kill them then. But again, Bentley and Bellman intervene. The battery flashlight is starting to die, so, well, there goes the divine power, guys. But they're not going to let the king and the others know that just yet. They let the mole people go, and it looks like one of them tries to say thank you. So now the king is pissed, and he says, just sacrifice three random girls then to Ishtar. The secret of death. For death shall appease Ishtar through the spirit bride of sacrifice. The priest looks so uncomfortable during this dance, it's actually pretty funny. I was trying to think of a funny song to stick here, but I decided I didn't want it to be taken down, so let's move on. So the three girls die. I guess I'm not sure how they died, because once it's revealed what's actually in that chamber, uh, it doesn't make any sense, but we'll get to that later. After the ceremony, a couple of the guards find Lafarge's body and they show the king. The king says, okay, these guys are clearly fake gods. What they do is set up Ada to give them some sort of mushrooms that knock them out. Now the priest gets his burning divine light like he always wanted. He 
Gator runs off to the Mole People pit, and they don't kill her, but I guess this in some sort of way starts up the final battle. They throw the two doctors in the sacrificial chamber, and they think it's over. But here come the mole people. We've nothing to fear. I have the burning light. The mole people pretty much kill all of the guards, his priests. and the king himself. So a lot die here, so I lost track of how many, but we're gonna guess the body count just got up there pretty high. Then the mole people save the two from the sacrificial room. And guess what it is? It's the fucking sun, that's all. And I guess the reason Ada doesn't cook is because she's blonde and for some reason all the others with the black hair and the pale white skin just instantly cook. I don't know, I guess she's also proof that at one time they were up above in the real world. I don't know, it, it's kind of skimmed over real fast. So with the mole people overtaking the kingdom, the other three escape up through the tunnel which the sacrificial light was coming down. And it brings them right back to the top of the plateau. I guess they didn't see that entrance earlier. Luckily their gear is all still there and they figure, hey, the other three guys are dead so Ada, sure, where are their gear? How nice of them. Also, where did the other tour guide's workers go? I thought there was at least eight or nine of them. And then this happens. Yeah, I know the count's a lot higher, but she runs back to die. So strange. And then the movie ends with a cave-in clearly sealing off the civilization that's still underground, never to see man above again. So that's the Mole People. I don't know if people consider the Mole People as part of the classic Universal Monsters, but maybe we can consider them in like the third or fourth wave for sure. I really dug the story with this one, but wish we got more Mole People action. They look really good, and you feel bad for them from time to time. They actually have more of a personality than some of the people who live underground with them. So when they start killing everyone at the end, you're like, alright, awesome, let's kill some assholes. The priest is a creepy guy, and his death is pretty satisfying. Same with the king. Most of the underground Ishtar people are kind of boring, like I said. It is all right, though. I still don't get why she ran back and tried to run in the hole. Like, they not have earthquakes under there, and that's what scared her, so she was trying to hide. Or could she just not survive after realizing, hey, up here kind of sucks? I really don't know. I wish they would explain that a little more. Hager is awesome as he always is, and so is Nestor. I kind of like him as the nervous guy who you know is going to die at some point. Overall, I do recommend this one. Grab some pizza and some beers, and check out the mole people.